Hi guys and welcome back to my channel. Today I have a very exciting video which I know that you guys are all really excited about. It is my collaboration with Yo Samdi Sam. So Yo Samdi Sam has a channel, go and check it out, it's absolutely fantastic. She's doing a brilliant job over there talking about autism and her experiences as an autistic adult. And she's joining me over here on my channel today to talk about her experiences as an autistic mother. We asked for your questions and now we are going to answer them. First of all, I'll just hand over to Sam for her intro. Hello Purple Ella viewers, I am Sam. I run a YouTube channel called Yo Sam Do Sam, which is also about autism and neurodiversity and, you know, being an autistic grown-up. So I hope you would like to check that out if you were a fan of Purple Ella's channel, who I also love. So the first question that you asked was, I don't have kids yet, but I'm worried I won't be able to cope with the various demands. What would you say to that? First of all, I would say that is completely understandable. Actually, when I had my children, I didn't give a huge amount of thought to what that would involve. I hadn't really thought much past being pregnant. But if I had given thought to the demands of parenting, I may never have done it because it does sound entirely terrifying. But I think it's like any new thing. When you don't have the skills and you don't have the know-how and you don't have the strategies to cope with a new situation, it can feel incredibly overwhelming and intimidating thinking to put yourself in that situation. Like any new job or any new friendship or any new relationship can feel scary like that and parenting is perhaps the biggest of all those things that you can throw yourself into. But much like any new job or any new situation, you adjust. You find a rhythm and a routine to your life as a mother. You find strategies to cope with the demands of parenting that might make be extra challenging for you as an autistic person. And you find your way to parent. And I think one thing I want to say on that topic is feeling like, oh, this is what parenting looks like because this person that I know that is a parent parents like this and that looks way too much for me doesn't mean that you have to parent like that. We all parent in our own individual ways based on the things that are important to us and the things that work for us as a family. So you can kind of shape your family and your parenting experience to be how you need it to be to cope. That said, there will be some things that will be really challenging and there will be some things that you will not be able to change because you are a parent and these things need to happen. But if being a parent is something that you really, really want, Try not to be too overwhelmed by the bigger picture and the long-term plan and take it one step at a time. So I think there's kind of like two things that will affect this. Um, there are a lot of unknowns before you have kids and um, quite frankly after you have kids as well, but you don't know what kind of parent you're going to turn out to be. Um, you also don't know what kind of kid you're going to turn out to have. You'll never really know if you'll cope or not. You just won't. It's, it's a leap that you have to take. And so I guess the question is, do you really want to be a parent? Because um, if you really want to be a parent and it turns out to be really, really demanding, but you still wanted it in the first place, it makes it much easier to cope with than if you were kind of doing it because maybe people expected you or maybe your partner wanted it. And so I guess you just have to really be honest with yourself because wanting to be a parent makes the demanding things so much easier in my opinion. Right, so the next question is, how do you manage your own sensory or emotional issues while also being a good parent? What are some different ways you found to be most helpful in prolonging parental autistic burnout? I think this one leads into like, how do you take care of yourself as a parent and specifically as an autistic parent? Um, I was diagnosed when my son was about 18 months, so I had that kind of baby fit phase where I kind of suspected I was autistic. I didn't have it confirmed. So I also felt like I, because I, it wasn't confirmed, I didn't have permission to try things out, you know, like sensory toys and weighted blankets and all these kind of things that I'm discovering really help me now. I was still a bit, I was kind of like in imposter syndrome. So, so I find it really difficult to give myself advice because there's still kind of a little bit of imposter syndrome, but I think, okay, well, what would help autistic people to cope with the sensory demands and stuff like that? And for me, making sure that I am, um, kitted out with good earplugs, good noise cancelling headphones, um, you know, the, have the sensory things I need, have things to do with my hands, fidget toys and spinners and, and things like that. And I recently bought a weighted blanket, which is also helping a great deal. So I don't want to say buy a load of stuff, but 
maybe just work out what your needs are and really pay attention to, to your own needs because I spent a lot of time kind of not having any clue what my own needs were and I think that earlier stage would have been a lot easier if I had done. With regards to burnout, I would really say get as much childcare as you need and you can afford because and don't feel guilty if you need to take more breaks than other parents might do. You don't look at other parents and say, well, they're a single parent and they're managing f fine. If you need the babysitter, get the babysitter. Now that is a real challenge. It is a balance. And I'm going to go back to a book that I read when I very first became a mother. I think Super Kid, my eldest, was about one and a half when I read this book. And it was a book by a, a British uh, website called Net Moms called How to Be a Happy Mom. And I'm so glad that I read it. And the bit in there that really struck me was, it's okay to expect that you can sit and read a book for 20 minutes, but not for three hours. And it's okay for your kids to expect that you will sit and do colouring in with them for half an hour, but not for four hours. And what that meant was that within a family balance as a parent, there has to be some of what you need, some of what your children need, some of what your partner needs, so that all of your needs are being met, but in a way that is a compromise so that all of your needs are being met. So you may not be able to address as much time to your sensory needs or your emotional needs as you did pre being a parent, but there are ways to find pockets of space and time to address those needs as and when you need them. I get the sensory things that I need, not in one big block, but as small chunks throughout the day, and that is still manageable. Next up, how do you deal with the executive functioning demands of being a parent? This is a really good one. Parenting is a, a massive amount of executive functioning demands, so I have systems in place that help me to cope with that. First and most obvious thing, if I receive a letter from school, a birthday party invitation for one of my children, I try and deal with it the minute that it's in my hands. I reply to the parent whether or not they can come. I sign the form and I put it by the door ready to go because if I put that down, it ain't never gonna happen. <laughs> so if possible, I try to deal with things as soon as they come in. If that's not possible, I have a particular place in my home, like, a, like an inbox, if you will where things that haven't been dealt with get put so I know that that pile of things over there needs to be dealt with as soon as possible. So that's how I deal with the kind of paperwork side of things. In terms of remembering everything that each child needs, as I've mentioned before now, I use Google Keep as a way of organising myself for to-do lists and notes. And every child has their own Google Keep page on my Google Keep app with where they're at, what they need, what the school day looks like, what the homework expectations are, what the school uniform code is, so that all the information that I need for that child is in one place for me to access if I've forgotten something. So it's a series of strategies of organising myself that I'm sure that those of you that aren't parents yet are applying to your regular lives and your regular tasks. So it's just an extra bunch of tasks to put into that category. So this is something that I have always struggled with, executive functioning, uh, especially when life gets very busy, and not just busy, but also it gets harder the more I have to ask other people or wait for their reply, and so I, I can do something, but it's not off my mind. Uh, and so being a parent, you have to spend more time with people that you don't particularly like, um, whether it's other mums at playgroups or things like that. Of course, you do find some friends, but most of them I don't really click with. Or, you know, taking them to the doctor's appointments, organising vaccinations, organising all these different things. And so since my diagnosis, it's really just been like... <laughs> trying different methods to see what works and rather than saying well I'm rubbish because I can't do this saying well this method is not right for me so I have been trying I did bullet journaling but that was a little bit too much upkeep so then I moved to another planner then I tried um, a to-do list and so it's really just about trying out um, all the different things that trying out different methods that you think might work for you. Something I'm trying out at the moment is called the, the Kanban method or the Kanban, Kanban method um, which is kind of like a to-do list management so I'm hoping that I'm kind of like just hoping that the next big strategy will help. Um, it's really hard, it's, it's really difficult. Do you find it difficult modeling social behavior for your child if it doesn't come naturally? I think that this is a really interesting question and I guess the answer would be that yes and also no because the idea of social behaviour 
is sort of, well, it's a neurotypical construct um, that this is how you act when you greet someone, you know, you do this and so you say hello. And I've got to the point where these very basic social interactions, it doesn't come naturally to me, but I do it anyway, regardless of whether I'm modelling it for my child. So he will see me doing that. But I think also that there is a difference between sort of social behaviour in the kind of neurotypical sense, but also pro-social behaviour. So, I mean, pro-social behaviour is essentially teaching them morality and saying, well, we don't share because society says that we have to share. We share because it, it's, it's the right thing to do and because it leads to a more harmonious uh, group or society or something like that. But I think also this question kind of implies that the parents are the only people who, who shape the child in that respect, and I don't think that's true. I think the, the minute you turn on the television, your child is exposed to social behaviour of, of some kind, and I know, for, I know my, my child really likes Blippi, and he really likes mimicking the things that Blippi says. Um, and, you know, he ha has little conversations that are like some of the, the blippy conversations or the blip, what blippy says to the, to the screen. So, um, it's not just all on us to do that. In a nutshell, yes, yes I do. I worry that my children won't be able to function socially in the world because I've not been able to teach them how. But what I remember is that I'm not the only person that they are learning social behaviour from. They are learning it from myself from Mr Purple, from their grandparents, from their aunts and uncles, from their friends in school, from their teachers, from television programmes. There's a whole bunch of influences on my children and their social behaviour that aren't just me. So I try not to worry about that too much. And in addition to that, when we talk about social behaviour, I would question which social behaviours are essential and which are not. So for example, I have taught my children to say please and thank you reliably as part of their interactions socially because I don't like to hear things like I want this, I like to hear I would like this please, that's just how I prefer to hear them talking. So I've taught them those kind of standard social rules that will help them to oil the wheels so to speak in life and not offend people and get by with politeness. But at the same time um, my aim in life is not to teach them to be normal, if that is even a thing. I am not trying to produce typical citizens. <laughs> my aim for my children is for them to be the best version of who they are. How was your birth experience? How do I answer this without terrifying all pregnant women that watch this video? Okay, my birth experience with Superkid was a challenge. I was 23 days late when I was induced to give birth to Superkid. The induction didn't work particularly well and I was in labour for about 28 hours and it ended with a c-section. It was quite a traumatic experience, I'm not gonna lie, but it was also a traumatic experience that I don't remember all that well 13 years later and let's not forget I went on to have two more children so it was obviously dealable with, but at the time it was really challenging and it was also really challenging being in hospital for five days afterwards. My birth experience with Roboboy was somewhat better. I didn't have a c-section. The hospital experience was still kind of traumatic but I wasn't in for as long. I was only in for one night and then I got to go home. So Robo's bo boy's birth was better and then Wonder Girl's birth was even better because we really knew what to expect. We knew how my body was likely to respond to stuff and I didn't have a c-section and I wasn't in for as long. I don't want to talk a huge amount about my birth experience because I think it can be quite frightening to hear people's birth experiences that aren't ideal when you're pregnant and I don't want to scare people. Suffice to say, it wasn't easy, it did hurt, but I had three children and I would do it all over again to be the mother that I am and have the children that I've got. My birth experience was actually pretty good considering that I had a dreadful pregnancy. I felt really, really awful. I had not exactly, it wasn't a high risk pregnancy, but there were definitely a lot of issues. And honestly, in my third trimester, I was going to the hospital for scans twice a week and it was just awful. And so I ended up, um, uh, my waters broke at 36 weeks. And so I ended up having an emergency C-section. And um, to be honest, it, it was, <laughs> 
it was good as, as a birth experience can be. Um, you know, before that I sort of had uh, ideas of being at home and having a doula and it all being like that, that's not what happened. But as it turned out, my birth, the birth itself was, was really straightforward. Um, and so I hope anyone, if anyone's scared of that, maybe, um, they'll know that it's not necessarily scary. And I was really scared of the idea before, before I went in. So it was actually, it was good. I was in hospital for seven days after that because, um, they were monitoring other things. So that was the time when I started to feel a little bit panicky because I, I wasn't very good at communicating with the staff. Um, you know, me and my husband don't have any family here. So it was, it was really like, um that was the difficult part for me was having to be in hospital for that week and not being very good at communicating obviously there's a slight language barrier as well i do speak dutch but i'm just given birth so uh, <laughs> how does autism help with your parenting i would say that actually my autism does provide benefits and make me a better parent in a lot of ways that might surprise neurotypical people i don't know i would say that it's easier for me to see behind the behaviors because I don't really believe that like behaviors are the the thing that goes on there's always a reason for the behaviors that's that's always mentally isn't it and so knowing what I went through as a child and then how I acted because of that helps me to understand my son um because he seems quite a bit like me at the moment I think the fact that um I realized I needed a bedtime routine you know my son had some sleep problems when he was uh I don't know, from about like 10 months up until I would say 18, 20 months. Um, and so we became very, very hyper-focused on developing a good sleep routine. And that's something that's carried on now. The sleeping is much, much better now, um, but we carry on with the routine. And it's like, there's no resistance because that's just what happens. And I'm not very good at implementing routines in other areas of my life, but this was definitely something because I knew if I was going to keep my sanity at all, I needed to stick to that routine and so I think that that has provided a very kind of like stable base for my son to develop good sleep patterns which I don't think necessarily came naturally to him but it seems like we're definitely getting there now. I also think I've always been very good at communicating with children because I don't project things onto them like I don't say well this, this kid is being manipulative because I don't think most kids are manipulative. I feel like my empathy allows me to to communicate well with kids on their level rather than from a, a sort of authoritarian point of view. The first way that I've always thought was really useful and was probably connected to my autism is that I'm really clear on boundaries and rules for my children. I think because I'm really clear in my head, maybe I'm a bit rigid in my head of my expectations of my children, that's made my expectations of the rules and the boundaries quite easy. The other way in which my uh, autism, I think, helps me as a parent is in parenting neurodiverse children. Two, certainly two out of three, and possibly even three, if I'm being completely honest, of my children are neurodiverse in some way or another. Two of them are on the autistic spectrum. And I am neurodiverse. And so for them, being neurodiverse is really quite normalised. It's not a scary, worrying, abnormal thing. Mum's neurodiverse, we're neurodiverse, some people are neurodiverse, some people are not. That's how it is in our house. Because I have personal experience of being neurodiverse, the challenges that that might create, and how that felt growing up to be able to pass on to my children, and I think that's a really helpful thing. Right, the next question is, how do you do it? Um, <laughs> the truth is, we don't all the time. You just, this is gonna be incredibly unhelpful advice, but you just do. Um, you don't really have a choice. There is a parental instinct, I believe, that kicks in. You you know that, that things have to happen. Your child has to be fed, your child has to be safe, this kind of thing. We do it really like any other parent. Uh, we just, I think, have more responsibility to take care of ourselves in a very conscious self-care kind of way in terms of our sensory needs especially and avoiding burnout because if you because it's very easy to slip into autistic burnout when you're a parent and so trying to develop you know support systems and things like that to help you know to help with your own needs um maybe having to spend more money on babysitters or therapists or something like that to deal with the demands of being a parent especially during the the early years how do you do it <laughs> I mean, some days I'm really not sure. Some days I'm like, wow, I've got three children 
and they're 13, 11 and 9 and they're still okay and they seem to be doing fine and I don't know how I did that. <laughs> so I love this question, it's a really appropriate question, how do I do it? How do I do it? One day at a time. One day at a time. That's how I, my, that's my like general approach to life these days, but particularly with parenting, I try not to worry too far into the future. I try not to think too much into the past. I deal with the present here and now. I try to be a loving, responsive mom. I try to build their self-esteem. I try to reduce their anxieties. I try to believe in them 100% so that they can believe in themselves. And I aim for them to be the best versions of who they are. That's how I do it. And the last question, does it get any easier? And if so, when? Yes, it does. I mean, I'm only almost three years in. Uh, it's already so much easier. I mean, it was, for me, I, the newborn phase was very peaceful and it was, it was really difficult sort of in the, the older baby to toddler kind of little toddler phase. Man, as soon as my son started talking, things got so much easier. Started talking, started sleeping. And now it's like, I wouldn't say it's easy, but really got so much easier and so all of that time when I was very sleep deprived not just for because of my son but because also or I had hormonal issues going on at the time which I didn't realize it's it's so easy to just see no way out and actually the period of time that it happens for it goes in waves developmental stuff always comes and goes in waves and yes it does get easier and for me it, for me it's around two and a half but for some people <laughs> Maybe not. I don't know. That's my experience and I'm sticking to it. Anyway. That's an interesting question because, yes, I would say that for me personally as a parent, it definitely has gotten easier. But I think that this depends on which stage of parenting you're going to struggle with the most. So I would roughly break down parenting so far, I have a 13 year old, into four stages. So there's the baby, cries a lot, can't tell you what it wants needs to be with you all the time, extremely physically demanding, you're exhausted because you're not getting any sleep, or not everybody, but for me personally, stage. I found that so, so, so hard. And in fact, if there wasn't a next stage, I'd have probably just had one child. I, I'm not gonna lie, I really found that very hard. The next stage is kind of toddlerhood into early childhood, and I love that but it's also still quite physically demanding so they can talk to you and they've got a little bit more interesting it's going to sound awful but i didn't find the babies that interesting whereas like playing games reading books doing finger painting going to the park going to the museum all that stuff with young young children i did enjoy that but it's still quite physically demanding you're not necessarily going to be getting all the sleep and all the rest that you would like because they are still potentially getting up quite early in the mornings and they are needing you the vast majority of the time and they're not yet in school although some people's children will never go to school and I have one at home all the time anyway but anyway they're, they're with you all the time it's quite a lot and this is I'm talking from my perspective as a parent who didn't go out to work I guess if you go out to work at this stage you would be back at work and that might make things a bit easier the next stage is kind of middle childhood where they this is a lovely 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 stage and that is where I would say it gets significantly easier they are a little bit more independent you can expect that they will entertain themselves for some periods of time and I would actively encourage that you get them to entertain themselves and teach them the skill of entertaining themselves during this period they are kind of even more interesting, they've got even more independent thought but they're still very much attached to you as their mum and they haven't started to be all teenage and like yeah whatever it's a lovely stage, I love that stage I'm talking about from sort of 4 to about 12 and then the next stage which I'm just going into, the teenage years Super Kid is a teenager I'm lucky, Super Kid's a great teenager, she's not, she's not mean or moody or she doesn't seem to think I'm an idiot yet, she still wants to spend time with me, but she has thoughts of her own a lot more, she disagrees with me more often, she is growing into her own person, she's growing independent as is right as she moves towards adulthood, uh, she is smarter than me in some things, she knows more than I do about some things, but I can expect her to entertain herself for an entire afternoon, which is fantastic I've got to say. 
Right, well I hope that you've enjoyed this video. Thanks so much again to Sam of Yo Samdi Sam for her contribution. I'm sure you'll agree that she had some really interesting insights there that I think are going to be really useful for everyone at home. Do go over and check out her channel. I think you're going to love her content. Um, and also, if you are here from Sam's channel, perhaps consider subscribing to mine because I really appreciate subscribers. They make me very happy indeed. Um, <laughs> I uh, produce content about autism and disability every week and I also do live streams and it would be great to see you subscribing over here. I also want to mention that I run a club called The Purple People which you can join via YouTube, look on my channel, click on the join button. I offer exclusive monthly video content for members in addition to community posts for members and a bunch of emojis and cool stuff like that so check that out. Thanks for being here and I will see you next week. Bye bye!